The shuttle landed gently on the ground, hard steel squashing gentle blades of grass as it began to offload its troops. Two thousand Gracanti, ape-like with four arms and heavy legs, all clad in traditional armor. They rapidly marched out of their transport and stood to attention in their ranks for their fourteen officers. This was one of many rites of submission the Great Compact allowed. Humanity, a new species, a new race, new faces in the universe, had been brushed aside by the Compact as a backwater barbarian race owing to their internal strife. So many of the empires and great nations invoked the right of submission. A right where the locals would be challenged to a duel between two warring forces. The process was simple. A war would take place that would have two static units engaging in war over territory. No more than 10,000 men per side would be allowed to commit to the conflict. The loser would permanently forfeit any claim to the system, but could invoke against any other system to try their luck again at any time. Even the homeworld could be invoked. If the defender loses the battle, they would immediately abandon all operations and leave the system. If they refused, the entire compact would attack them and wipe them out. It was easier and simpler than mass genocide or outright warfare and costed less lives and resources. It was a system that worked, and to make it fair for local primitives or other such civilizations, the right would be conducted on their own home turf to give an advantage. The Gracanti were expecting an easy victory as they massed on a small island archipelago on the human world Taranth VI, a jungled world surrounded by volcanoes and dense brush. This would be easy, not only because a jungle was their own natural element, but also due to a technological advantage they had. Plasma pistols and laser cannons would be all too easy to defeat the humans' primitive pulse rifles and projectile weapons. After all the troops disembarked and waited for their barked orders, they stood to attention, checking weapons. A bright red flash of light in the sky from a large flare signaled the start of the right, and the general began a speech. All present puffed their chests with pride and held their heads high. This would be an easy victory, they thought. Their sensory gear could pick up no movement anywhere or see anything nearby. The general stopped in his tracks, let out a soft moan of pain, then collapsed dead on the ground. A soldier broke ranks and attempted to provide aid only to find a small hole in the back of the general's head. Green blood now stained his hands. He screamed out they were under attack, just as his squad captain let out a small squishy noise, splattering blood on the poor sod behind him, then fell to the floor, dead. Panic gripped the unit as they sprinted for cover and began looking for targets, only to find none. A few moments passed with naught but silence, no more deaths, no nothing. One officer poked his head out to check for anything and instantly died as a bullet went into his eye. The group began to panic fire into the trees on the mountain to try cover. Six more men died from bullets, each one a perfect shot right to his head. Even though these men wore helmets that easily deflected shots in most cases, the bullets just pierced straight through. The panic fire continued for a bit longer, and a few officers braved the firing line, calling to stop. A few tense moments followed, and no more death happened. The officers rallied their troops and sent them into the trees. They found nothing. No ammunition, no tracks, no traces. Most of the soldiers ran into the jungle and experienced an eerie silence with not even birdsong in the air. Nothing but the quiet hum of the wind and the soft rustling of leaves. To secure their way back, a squad of 50 men guarded the transports. A retreat meant a loss, but a loss could be learned from. There were 50 transports, all of them in the air, hovering gently a few feet above the ground and a squad of 200 to guard them. A loud thud was suddenly heard in the distance, shortly before one transport was instantly destroyed, going up in a massive fireball. A few of the men nearby were incinerated or blown back by the explosions. Seconds later, another impact blew the engine clean off another transport, causing it to spin uncontrollably, taking out two more transports in the process as it crashed into them. Panic gripped the men on the ground as two more transports were hit one of which landed on a screaming officer who was unfortunate enough to be trying to calm his troops down in the precise wrong spot. Suddenly, mass explosions and random detonations began occurring in the mountain. 
The unit of 200 sent to scour the mountainside was now panicking, firing wildly into the trees as they suddenly detonated, legs and arms suddenly being severed. Now, beset on two fronts, the transports were easy prey and one shell perfectly hit the cockpit, killing the pilot who slammed it into the ground, crushing a squad of six men. By the time any officer had collected himself enough to give any orders, the mountain unit was all dead or dying, and only 13 of the 50 transports were still flying. An order to retreat was given, and the transports fled. As they ascended into the sky, a streak of smoke suddenly emerged from the mountains surrounding them. Every transport was hit with a missile strike that came out of nowhere. First five, then eight, then ten missiles, each aiming for a transport, streaked across the sky. No transport survived the attack, and now the army was stranded, trapped fighting an enemy they didn't understand, nor could even see. The officers wisely assumed that the mountains had traps or other such means to dissuade attackers. The only real road through was the roads. This was a bad idea, as the officers later found out. Smartly, however, they ordered their men to stagger formation and space themselves to defend against explosive attacks like those seen in the mountains. The force was now stranded and had lost a total of 300 of the 2,000 men. They still had plenty of strength and carried on. The army marched on. A group of 400 or so crossed a long bridge leading to the larger island in the archipelago chain. This army was just about to cross a bridge when a massive explosion rocked the front and rear simultaneously. The bridge at both ends suddenly collapsed, trapping the army where it stood. They collected themselves quickly and began to look for any trace of their targets. Nothing. The two officers that were there hid carefully, using their soldiers as cover. The army was now trapped 200 feet in the air on a bridge over a raging river. Any man who fell in the river was condemned in those merciless rapids if they aren't crushed by the falling bridge or killed by the explosion. Two more explosions suddenly racked the column, again at both ends of the bridge. Then two more explosions again at the same point, the north end of the bridge collapsing. The south end of the bridge collapsing after a third explosion. An officer was about to give an order when an explosive shell landed directly on his head, detonating such that any soldier not caught by the blast was splattered with fragments of his bones and armor or splattered with a shower of his blood. Two more explosions, followed by a further bridge collapse, marked the end of the bridge army as the last two segments of the bridge collapsed, condemning all to a watery or messy grave. That one failure marked the death knell. With only four of its original 14 officers, and only had 1,300 of its original 2,000, still plenty of strength, an army of 200 marched south from the bridge and made their way through what looked like an industrial area or some kind of logging storage yard. They spotted movement in the camp and charged forth, firing wildly as both a cover for their advance and a means of intimidation. They went in and gathered around a strange idol. It was a strange ape-like creature, or at least a faux approximation of one sitting on a box while holding two strange circular metal devices. It appeared to be a children's toy of some kind. The army carefully scanned the local area and found nothing but this strange idol. One soldier, seemingly out of curiosity, picked up the toy and it began to emit a shriek and banged its metal objects together, making a ringing noise. The toy had a string attached to it, and as it was picked up a whirr, then click noise was heard. As the soldier looked at the string, he realized the monkey was sitting on a box of explosives. Demolition charges placed at key locations all across the yard suddenly detonated. Any man that was left alive began to panic and run, followed by being quickly shot and killed by a bullet from nowhere. Two hundred men died. Three officers left, an army of four hundred moving towards an outpost seen from the skies. A long road towards it. Every few paces the army took, two or three men would receive a bullet and fall dead. The army would stop raise their rifles, someone would open fire at the sight of movement, and then after a barrage of fire would stop. Sudden ambushes from the trees of automatic gunfire would spray the road down, killing a few men, then suddenly stop. Remaining soldiers would run up into the mountainside or the jungle and find nothing. A few of the men sent to investigate would not return to formation. A slow whittling of troops as they approached the outpost had them broken, and fearful, the officer in charge, barely capable of keeping his men together, was out in the open. He realized this too late, 
as his head suddenly disappeared in a shower of bone and blood. With the officer dead, there was nothing stopping the army from panic firing wildly before their forces were hit by a series of explosions seemingly from above. There were no aircraft to be seen, and no enemy could be found. As the army was whittled down, one man was all that was left. It was here the first human warrior was seen. He emerged from the jungle and approached the Gracanti holding an automatic rifle. It was a human, wearing green armor that looked like fabric with the only metal in his armor being interwoven plating around his chest and the helmet on his head. The Gracanti, still in a panic, tried to open fire, only to realize his rifle's plasma charges were spent from his wild firing. The human approached, getting within spitting distance, and aimed his weapon, emptying the ammunition clip into the Gracanti warrior. Then, with a sadistic smile, vanished back into the trees. An army to the west, a force of 300 met a sudden and messy end as they encountered a human military vehicle. A single military vehicle met them in an open field. An ugly, boxy-looking thing on primitive tracks with a single turret-mounted gun. Officers were unnerved by it. Its gun was strange. It had eight barrels that spun around. On registering a threat, the vehicle charged at them and began firing. The army had fallen into a perfect trap and the vehicle's gun began spraying thousands upon thousands of rounds into the army's forces and slaughtering every man there. Plasma weapons fired at it would be too slow and the vehicle's speed would allow it to ignore them as it moved. The armor plating was mirrored or polished, so laser fire would bounce off it harmlessly. The battle lasted barely two minutes as the machine flanked the army and hit their broadside. An army of around a hundred had come across terrain too difficult to traverse and had fallen back to their entry point, only to find a smoldering graveyard of their comrades. Incensed by this dishonor, they moved west to the bridge. Their existence was short-lived. A few strange cylindrical objects suddenly appeared at their feet and began to spew out smoke obscuring their view. A scene of terror and horror followed, making men panic and run. The sight of a human using a device known as a flamethrower was a scene reminiscent of their ancient history of a god of hatred and vengeance that plagued them millennia ago. The sight caused many to flee, only to be immediately killed by a bullet from the blue. Those that stood their ground or failed to run in time were engulfed by a blazing inferno that scorched their skin and boiled them in their own armor. Seeing that the world in the open was a means of death, the last 300 men carefully made their way through the terrain and tried to avoid the roads and open areas. 100 of those men fell prey to random bullets from nowhere, traps in the trees or terrain pits. The last remaining officer in the group hit a pitfall trap, and the soldiers with him panicked and fled into the trees as they saw him face up in the trap with his body turned into a literal pincushion. The remaining 200 or so were picked off by snipers or fell prey to traps and mines. By the time it was over, a group of 10 were left, 10 out of 2,000. Those 10 were now cowering in fear in the middle of a field. One soldier, seemingly now insane, called his enemy to show themselves, fight like real warriors. Their panicked firing had expended all of their ammunition, and they only had blades to fight now. They towered over the humans, though, so it meant nothing. They would win. The soldiers stood in a circle and taunted their enemy to show themselves. A sudden spray of blood showered one soldier as nine of the ten men suddenly dropped dead from a bullet. The remaining soldier screamed in rage and terror as he frantically wiped his face clean of his brother's blood. He screamed at the locals to show themselves, daring the humans to face him in combat. He heard a rustling noise and suddenly two dozen humans appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Each was wearing a selection of bushes and face paint, making them blend in perfectly in the brush, each one armed with a high-caliber weapon. Before the soldier could do anything, a bullet blew one of his kneecaps off, severing his left leg from his body. He writhed in pain for a few moments before one human came up to him with a large-caliber pistol and finished him off. The Gracanti Armada present in the system recorded the entire event and frantically turned tail. As the ships moved, they screamed in terror as they realized that humanity's navy had deployed a massive array of limpet mines directly in their path while they were distracted. As each mine, a kiloton-level nuclear warhead magnetically attached itself to each hull a hundred times over, a message was sent on an open comm. 
Pity the poor little children who think fancy guns and big ships make them strong. Make sure you tell the galaxy what happened today. We will be waiting for them, and we will leave no witnesses. The limpet mines detonated, obliterating the entire armada. The only vestiges of the Gracanti starship fleet disintegrated into pieces of nothing but slag and wreckage. The only survivor was a barely functioning frigate that only took one hit from the detonation. Humanity let it escape, for what reason the galaxy would never know. The galaxy saw the recording. The compact forbade any future rights against humanity and forbade traitors from their space. Many armadas and starship fleets endeavored to try to gain vengeance and retaliate. These fleets were never heard from again.